has been a New Orleans Saints football fan and uh, had season tickets. But I began to feel a real longing in my heart for something different. And I, I started to suspect that it was God impressing me to get with the real saints of God. I started visiting different churches. And the first church I decided to go to was right near my home. Big, impressive-looking facility. And there were always a lot of cars there. I thought, let me check it out. So this particular Sunday morning, I went to the early service because there was a football game in the afternoon and I had to hurry and get out of there to see the other saints. So I walked into the building and it was stunning. There was a band on the platform and the music was loud and vibrating and the lights going and people just raising their arms and singing at the top of their lungs and moving around and it was electric. And I thought, hmm, times have changed. And then came time for the Lord's Supper. And they passed out a little white wafer about the size of a quarter. Had a picture of Jesus stamped in it, about as thick as a potato chip. And we all got one of these wafers. And they told us to hold it. So I held mine. And then the high point of the service, the, the pastor held his little wafer up high. And then there was a drum roll and a clash of cymbals, and he snapped his wafer and everybody else snapped theirs and I snapped mine and it just sounded like electricity all through the auditorium. It was powerful and the music started and people were singing and praising God and waving their Bibles. It was the most exciting meeting I'd ever been to and on the way out I was walking next to a young fella and he goes Phew. We worshipped. We worshipped. I raced home, changed clothes, got in my car and dashed down to the stadium to see the Saints. Opening kickoff. The Saints received the kickoff and ran it back for a touchdown and the whole stadium was up on their feet standing on their chairs shouting and waving their arms in the air and I was up shouting and waving my arms in the air and suddenly it dawned on me whoa that's exactly the way I felt in church this morning am I worshiping now Revelation, the 13th chapter. The dragon, verse 2, gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. And verse 4, men worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. And then the false prophet appears and he performs signs and wonders and miracles and he was given power to do and because of the miracles he caused all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 a third angel followed and said if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead he'll receive the wine of the wrath of God. In chapter, in chapter 14, verse 7, Fear God and give Him glory. The hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. 
You can't read Revelation 13 and 14 without coming to the conclusion that the real central issue in those two chapters is worship. The whole world is going to be divided between those who worship the Creator and those who worship the creature who is the beast. Worship is the issue. Well, what is worship? And we find the answer to that vital question in verse 11 of chapter 14. There is no rest day and night for those who worship the beast and his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Notice the contrast between those who worship the beast and take his mark and those who are faithful saints of God who obey the commandments of God. You cannot separate obedience to God from worship. Now, I'm going to show you in the next five minutes what I call the mark of the beast principle. And if you get the mark of the beast principle, you will know what the mark of the beast is. It's that obvious. I believe that Jesus laid it out clearly for us in Matthew, the 15th chapter, starting with the second verse, when some of those Pharisees we talked about the other night were challenging him again. They came to Jesus and they said, verse 2, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Now, you've got to notice what their concern is. What is their concern? It is the tradition of the elders. The tradition of man. Tradition is rules or commands that were instituted by man and not by God. So they're worried about Jesus and his disciples breaking the traditions of their church. Now watch. Jesus always had the right answer, didn't he? Watch what he does. He replied in verse 3, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your traditions? Whoa! Did he turn it around or not? What's the matter with your disciples? They're breaking the traditions of our church. Well, why are you breaking the commandments of God for the sake of your traditions? And then he explains. He explains how God said, honor your father and mother, and that means more than just lip service. That means more than just hollering, love you, Mom, when you happen to be on TV. He shows that it even means that we should honor them by supporting them when they're no longer able to support themselves. But these church people were taking the money that should have gone to support their parents and they were putting it in the offering plate in church. Why were they doing that? Because the more they gave, the more powerful they would appear in the eyes of others. And so their tradition was, well, if you give more, maybe you can sit closer up to the front or higher up, or wear a bigger robe, or whatever. So they were taking money that should have gone to support their parents, and they were putting it in the offering plate in church. And so Jesus said, thus, verse 6, thus you nullify the Word of God for the sake of your tradition. Do you hear this? You nullify the Word of God for the sake of your tradition. 
Nullify means you're just throwing out the Word of God. You're putting your traditions over the Scripture. Verse 7, you hypocrites, Jesus said. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain because their teachings are rules taught by men, traditions. Now sometimes we get so close to the forest that we can't see the forest for the trees. And when we read a verse like this, well, the, the commandment says, honor your father and mother. He's talking about the fifth commandment. And they were putting the money in the church offering plate. But step back. Let's look at the forest instead of the trees. Let's look at the principle instead of the detail. There's always a principle underneath the detail. The problem wasn't so much the money. No more than for Eve when she ate the fruit. The problem wasn't so much the fruit. It was the fact that she didn't trust God. So what is the principle here? The principle is that when someone puts the traditions of man over the commandments of God, they are nullifying the Word of God. They're making it as though it doesn't even exist. And that means that their worship is not really worshiping God at all. Their worship is in vain because they put the traditions of man over the commandments of God. Now let's take a look at it through the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment says, remember the seventh day that God blessed and made holy Keep it holy. And the church says, we changed that one. And now it's remember the first day and keep it holy because that's our tradition. Be careful now. Follow me. If someone put the traditions of Rome over the commandments of God, wouldn't they be doing the same thing that these Pharisees did? When Jesus said, you worship me in vain because you're putting the traditions of man over the commandments of God. That's the mark of the beast principle. Satan is no dummy. He knows if he came up to you and said, worship me, bow down and worship me, I'm Satan. You're not going to do that. But what if he managed to deceive someone into putting the traditions of the Roman church over the commandments of God, then if I understand what Jesus said, he would be accomplishing the same event, the same end. That's the mark of the beast principle. Well, if that's the mark of the beast principle, then what is the mark of the beast? Turn to Revelation chapter 7 quickly. And in the 7th chapter, verse 2, I saw another angel coming up from the east having the seal of the living God. So God has a mark. God has a seal. Watch this. He calls out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. He said, do not harm the land of the sea of the trees until we put a seal on the forehead of the servants of our God. So God's people are going to be marked with God's seal before the time of great tribulation comes on this earth. God's people have a mark. God has a mark. But yet in Revelation 14, we discover practically the whole world worships a beast and has his mark on their foreheads. 
So John is looking ahead to the time when the world is divided into two camps. Those who have God's mark on their foreheads and worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. And on the other side, those who have the beast mark on their foreheads and worship the creature who is the beast. The mark of the beast is a counterfeit to the seal or the mark of God. And the best way to know what the mark of the beast is is to know what the mark of God is. You see, you can study the counterfeit all you want, but that's not going to help you. Everybody wants to know about the beast. And there are books and books about the beast and about the mark. But you can uh, understand the counterfeit. Maybe you got deceived. Maybe you got taken by a counterfeit $20 bill. And you get angry and say, I'm never going to do that again. I'm going to take that $20 bill. I'm going to memorize every picture, every color, every curve, everything on it. So I'll never be deceived by a counterfeit $20 bill. That won't help you. You could be deceived by a different counterfeit $20 bill. Wouldn't it make more sense to study the real thing? To study a real $20 bill? Then you can spot any counterfeit. And so instead of spending so much time, as a lot of people want to do, on what is the beast, what is the mark, I would rather spend my time studying what is the truth, and you'll know what the mark is. Some of you got it already. I saw you nodding your heads. You got it. But let's go on. There's a lot more. What is God's mark? When you see God's mark, then you will know for sure what the beast's mark is. Turn to Old Testament. Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. Moses said, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Now, he had just finished reviewing the Ten Commandments. Just finished reviewing the Ten Commandments. Now watch what he says. Oh, you're going to be surprised. You say, I never saw that before. Watch this. Verse 8. Tie them. Tie what? God's Ten Commandments. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. What? God's Ten Commandments on our hands and on our foreheads. So that to remind you that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. Tie them as symbols on your hand. Bind them on your foreheads. So God wants his law on our hands and on our foreheads, the Ten Commandments. Now, before you start thinking that we need to tattoo these things on, <laughs> he says he's got a lot of things he wants us on our foreheads, the name of God, the New Jerusalem, Mount Zion. The name of the Lamb. The God doesn't want us walking around like a bunch of NBA basketball players. <laughs> That's not what he's talking. He says that to tie them as symbols on your hand and bind them on your foreheads. Now watch this verse in comparing Scripture with Scripture. Exodus chapter 13. The uh, 13th chapter, the 9th verse. This observance, underline that, this observance for you will be like a sign on your hand and like a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. So observing God's instructions, observing God's commands is like a sign on your forehead like a reminder on your hands. It's the observing of the law that is like a sign on the forehead and on the hand. So the Bible isn't saying he wants a mark of his law tattooed on our heads. He wants us to believe his law, the head. But it isn't enough to just believe it he wants us to do his law, the hand. It's like a mark. It's not a tattoo. It's not a laser beam. It's not a computer chip. The law of God is like a mark. When we observe the law, when you obey the law, it's like having a mark on your forehead and on your hand. The issue is worship, and worship is intimately bound to obedience. 
Those who worship God obey God. Those who worship the beast put the traditions of Rome over the commandments of God. It's as simple as that, folks. Then there's something else exciting in the book of Exodus. God's mark of allegiance is his law, his Ten Commandments. But there's something exciting about the law. It's the fourth commandment right in the center of God's law. And listen to what it says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy because, and then verse 11, in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Now, when we were in Israel or in Egypt, and in London, we went to the big Cairo Museum in Egypt and the big, the big museum in London, the British Museum. We happened to see collections of ancient seals in both of those museums. Seal is a stamp that the king used as a symbol of his authority. Every one of those seals from way back Every seal had three components. The king's name, his authority, and the territory over which he governed. Every single one. For example, even today, the seal of the President of the United States of America says his name. President, his authority of the United States of America, the territory. The same as the ancient Bible seal. Now watch this. In the heart of the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, verse 11, for in six days the Lord, all uppercase letters, His name, Yahweh, made His authority the Creator, the heavens and the earth, the territory over which he rules. Wow! Right at the heart of the law of God is a stamp of his name, his authority, and his territory. What gives God the right to issue a Ten Commandment law? He has the authority to do it because he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And it's stamped right in the heart of his law. And it's the only commandment that deals with time because time is the reminder once a week that God is the creator. No wonder Daniel showed the little horn as the Antichrist who would think to change God's set times and laws. The dragon gave the beast his authority? God's authority is that he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. So now the Bible points to the Sabbath as a sign of God's authority, a seal of his authority. And not just here. I'm not just making it up. I'm not just assuming it. Exodus chapter 31, God said through Moses, verse 13, you must observe my Sabbath." This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. The Sabbath, God said, is a sign between us and Him so that we can know that He makes us holy. Now, folks, I'm not interpreting anything here. This is not interpretation. This is just reading what God said. I didn't say it. God did. God said to Moses, tell my people this will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Why do I need the Sabbath as a sign so that I can know God sanctifies me, saves me, makes me holy? Why do I need the Sabbath? Because it takes the same creative power of God to recreate us 
to pick up the broken pieces, to put them into something special and make me be a new creation in Jesus Christ. It takes the same creative power as it did in the beginning to create man at first. And the Sabbath is a sign that God is our creator, but it's also a sign that God is our Savior, our Redeemer. He makes us holy because only the Creator can save us. Do you think it was a coincidence that Jesus did His work for us and on the preparation day He finished His work and He died and then He rested on the Sabbath and rose again on the first day of the week? He was finished with His work of salvation for us. He rested on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a reminder that He is our Creator and a reminder that He is our Recreator through the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, no wonder the devil hates it. And he does. We are not saved because we keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a sign that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We're not saved because we obey God. We obey God because he takes this miserable, rebellious sinner and turns him into one who loves him and has his law written on our hearts, sealed with the mark of the creator of the heavens and the earth. No wonder Revelation 14 says in the first angel's message, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. It is quoting that part of the fourth commandment that contains the seal of the living God because the beast is going around claiming to be God. Now, you see why we had to spend a little time studying some of these other issues. And now is it getting clear the seal of God is a sign of obedience to God as our Creator and Redeemer. And the Bible says, not Cologne, the Bible says that's the Sabbath. So it has nothing to do with church. No matter which church you go to or I go to, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has everything to do with the Word of God. We obey God because He saved us. The Old Testament's clear, but folks, the New Testament is even clearer, stronger. Turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. John had already written in his gospel, this is life eternal, that we know Jesus Christ. Anybody have a problem with that? Are you with me? All right. This is life eternal, that we know Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay. You're just so stunned, I'm sure, that uh, you don't know what to say. This is life eternal. We know Jesus Christ. But how do we know if we know him? How do you know that you know Jesus? Listen to what John said. We know, verse 3, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. How do we know we know Jesus if we obey his commands? Well, what if we don't obey his commands? Listen, I would never have the courage to say this, so I'm not going to say it. I'm going to let John say it. I'll read his words. So if you want to get mad at somebody, get mad at John, not me. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. What if somebody says, I know Jesus, but they're not willing to keep his commands? John said, that person is a liar. No matter how good they may appear, no matter how sincere they might seem, if they claim to know Jesus and do not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in them. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we're in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. What does that mean? It means follow the lamb. How do you know you're in him? Follow the lamb. 
It's so simple. God's way is always simple. John Calvin, one of the great reformers, said that obedience to, to the Sabbath, of course he was thinking Sunday, is a symbol of obedience to God. You think about it. If you keep the Sabbath, you're a lot less likely to lie, to steal, to kill. I'm not saying it's perfect. We all make mistakes. But if you keep the Sabbath, doesn't that lift up the others in importance too? Now, sometimes people tell me, Pastor, all you want to talk about is the Sabbath. That's not true. I've talked about a lot of other things. Pastor, you just single out the Sabbath and you make it more important than any of the other commandments. That's not true. I do not single out the Sabbath. The Sabbath is no more important than any other of the Ten Commandments. Those who say that it is not important, they're the ones that are singling it out, not me. And they're the ones that are forcing me to talk about it a lot more than I would have to if they would teach what the Bible says. So I'm not singling it out. I'm having to answer questions. But we're having to answer questions because we want to know what God says. Sabbath is no more important than any of the other commandments. No less important than any of the other commandments. But in this one sense, the Bible singles it out as a sign of allegiance to God. And in the last day, a sign of allegiance to God contrasted with a sign of allegiance to the beast. What could be a better distinction? What could be a better test as to whether or not we trust God? Look at the Ten Commandments. A lot of people that don't even claim to believe in God won't lie or steal or kill. There are a lot of decent people who won't do these. They won't commit adultery. They know these things are wrong. If you kill someone, you know that you've done wrong. There's something inside you that instinctively lets you know these things are wrong. Even worshiping idols and taking God's name in vain. I have friends who don't even claim to be believers. And they get offended when you take God's name in vain. There's something about these things that it just don't seem right. But you will never wake up on a Saturday morning and go mow your lawn and be struck in with pangs of guilt because it's the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is no different from the first day. It's 24 hours. You're not going to wake up... Smells like Sabbath, unless your wife lights candles. It smells sweet for Sabbath. The air doesn't feel any different on Sabbath. There's only one way for you to know that Saturday, the seventh day, is a Sabbath day, and that's because God said, I blessed it and made it holy. And so in that sense, it becomes the sheer test as to whether or not we believe God. It becomes a sheer test in faith, not works, but faith. Did God mean it when he said, I blessed it and made it holy? Did he mean it when he said, I worked six days, I rested on the seventh day. Come, join with me in my rest on the seventh day. Did he mean it? The only way you can know that is by faith and trust in the Word of God. In that sense, it becomes the perfect test do we really trust God? It becomes a test. Up until now, we've talked about the Sabbath. And a lot of you have said, yeah, Pastor, I believe that. It's clear. It's in the Bible. But then I ask, well, have you thought about keeping the Sabbath yet? Well, I don't know how important that is. I mean, I've always been taught all my life that Sunday is the Lord's day and you know we after all we set aside a day that's what's really important and I haven't argued up until now I haven't said much about it until now but I'm saying it now that I believe it's important for us to do what God says to do no matter who else says anything different 
Are you with me? It's important to do what God says to do. Well, if the Sabbath then is a sign of allegiance to God's authority as the creator of the heavens and the earth and our recreator through the cross of Christ, if the Sabbath is God's sign, God's mark, then what does Rome point to as the mark of her authority? That's the question. And that's a rhetorical question. Don't holler it out. I want to answer it. <laughs> because I know a lot of you got it already. Martin Luther, as we've learned, is, was a Roman Catholic priest teaching a class on the book of Romans at the University of Wittenberg. And Luther discovered from Romans that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by works. And he began to teach that. And Rome said, no, Luther, we're not saved by faith alone. We're saved by faith plus good works. And Luther said, but the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone and not by good works. And the church said, Luther, you don't understand. The Bible isn't the final rule of authority. It's the Bible and the traditions of the church. And Luther said, maybe for you, but not for me. For me, it's the Scripture and the Scripture alone. And the Scripture says we're saved by grace through faith in the cross of Jesus Christ, period. And the church said, Luther, you must abide by the traditions of the church. And Luther said, now I know who the Antichrist is. And the Protestant Reformation was born. Thousands and thousands of protesters protesting Rome's stand on tradition, following Luther on the Scripture and the Scripture alone. So many that Rome had to do something to stop this massive outflow. And finally, they called the meeting, the Council of Trent, Eighteen years the church met, deliberating, how are we going to stop this massive outflow? One of the very first things they did, the Roman church stood firmly on the basis that tradition, not Scripture, is the rock upon which the church is built. Catholic doctrine is defined by the Council of Trent, page 157. Tradition, not Scripture, that's the rock. But somehow, they had to show that these protesters, these Protestants protesting Rome, in spite of all the noise they were making about the Bible and the Bible alone, in spite of all the fuss, sola scriptura in Latin, the scripture and the scripture alone, no matter how loud they shouted, we've got to show them somehow that they respect and honor the traditions of Rome over the scripture. How can we do it? And at the very end towards the very end of the Council of Trent, the Archbishop of Reggio made a very powerful speech when he said, here is the answer. He openly declared that tradition stood above the Scripture because the church has changed the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to Sunday, the first day of the week, not by the command of Christ, but by its own authority. So Rome points to the change of the Sabbath as a mark of her own authority over the Scripture. Cardinal Gibbons wrote in his book, Question Box, page 179, if the Bible is the only guide for the Christian, then the Seventh-day Adventist is right in observing Saturday. Interesting, huh? Isn't that strange that those who make the Bible their only teacher should inconsistently follow in this matter, which is the tradition of the Catholic Church? I agree with the good cardinal. He's right. C.F. Thomas, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons. Of course the Catholic Church claims, listen to the language, I don't believe it's a coincidence, 
Of course the Catholic Church claims that, claims that the change was her act, and that act is the mark of her power and authority in religious matters. We changed the Sabbath, and that's a mark of our authority. But it was the dragon who gave his authority to the beast. And to honor that authority is to recognize and worship the beast. No matter how sincere somebody might seem. The real issue, folks, is not so much the day when you go to church. That's not so much the issue. Of course, we've seen the Sabbath is a day of sacred assembly, the Bible says. But the issue is much deeper than that. The issue is, who do we trust? God said, I have blessed the seventh day. I made it holy. Come and rest with me. And the church says, no, we have changed it to the first day of the week now, not the seventh day. Come with us. And by our actions, we show who we trust because we worship the one that we choose to obey. Cardinal Gibbons goes on to say, reason and sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these two alternatives. Either be a Protestant and keep Holy Saturday or be a Catholic and keep Holy Sunday. Compromise is impossible. And he's right. He is right. The issue is clear. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you'll labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. And the church says, no, we have changed it to the first day of the week. And lo, practically the entire world follows in wonder after the beast. Look around, folks. You have seen that prophecy fulfilled. A lot of people have a couple of questions at this point. What about my mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and great-grandma and grandpa, great-grandpa? They have been sincere Christians. They followed Jesus. They did the best they knew, but they kept Sunday. They're dead now. Are they lost? God isn't like that. We may be, but he isn't. James makes that clear. He said, he who knows what is right and does it not, for him it is sin. God doesn't hold us accountable for things we don't know. Sometimes people say, well, what about me? I went to church this morning. I've done it all my life. Am I a sinner? First of all, it's never wrong to go to church, folks. Never wrong. But when God said, work six days, rest on the seventh day, and don't work on that day, and keep it holy for me, then if we don't do it, it's wrong. But I haven't been doing that. Have I been sinning all these years? He who knows what is right and does it not. And one lady said, you mean folks don't even go there? <laughs> she said, you mean if I wouldn't have come tonight, then I wouldn't have known. If I hadn't have come to Revelation, hey, don't be afraid of the truth. If what I'm saying is not true, you have nothing to worry about. Keep doing what you're doing. But if what I'm saying is true from the Word of God, then you still have nothing to worry about because the truth will set you free. You need to be afraid not to know the truth. It's not true because I said it. It's true because he says it. So the question for you is, did he say it? Don't trust Cologne. Don't trust me. Don't trust any man or any church. Trust what the Bible says. I'm not afraid to put my faith to the acid test of the Word of God. Don't you be afraid. Amen. Test it out. And then people ask me, do I have the mark of the beast now since I've been keeping Sunday? 
Do I have the mark? No one has the mark of the beast now. Did you hear me? Does anybody have the mark of the beast now? Tell me. Does anyone have the mark of the beast now? No. Does anyone at all have the mark of the beast now? No. <laughs> now, why did I do that? Because no matter how many times I do it, somebody is going to leave here and say, that preacher said everybody who goes on Sunday has the mark of the beast. If you say that, you are bearing false witness because that's not what I'm saying. The time is coming when Sunday observance will be the mark of the beast. I want to be crystal clear about that. It will be. But not until it is enforced by boycott and a death decree will anyone take the mark. Well, how can that ever happen? Here. I mean, we live in America. We just sang about it. This is the land of the free. And we're free to worship God as we choose. So how can anybody force me to worship the beast? Back to Revelation 13. Revelation, the 13th chapter. Chapter 12, verse 17, the dragon was angry at the woman, went to make war against the remnant of offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold the testimony of Jesus. That's the, that's the issue, folks. Is it getting plain now? And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Beast we've already identified, the medieval church at Rome, 538 till 1798, when he received a deadly wound. And then in verse 2, at the end of the verse, the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. So the beast gets his authority from the dragon. Verse 4, men worship the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast and they worship the beast. Well, how does this happen? Verse 8, all the inhabitants of the earth are worship the beast except for those whose names are written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb. All of the inhabitants of the earth. How does that happen? Chapter 13, verse 11, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf, and he made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. After the, the fatal wound had been inflicted, 1798, we should see another nation rising to power from the earth. First beast came up from the water. Revelation 17, 15, the waters represent multitudes of people. First beast, the Roman power ascended in Rome, the middle of the civilized world, among a multitude of people. But this second beast comes up out of the earth, a relatively quiet portion of the world compared to the one that came out of the water. And it was sometime around the late 1700s that he started rising to power. And this beast coming up out of the earth, late 1700s, had two horns like a lamb. He would look like a Christian nation. If you haven't put it all together yet, you live there. So there was only one major power rising, the power in the late 1700s. There was a Christian nation in a relatively quiet part of the world. The United States of America? Protestant? America, with the freedom to worship God as we choose, but she would speak like the dragon. Protestant America is going to change. Now, I want to say something. I'm not un-American, I'm not anti-American, and I'm not unpatriotic. I love my country. I risked my life for the principles of freedom that we hold so dear in the United States of America. But I don't like what the prophet says is going to happen. And I don't like what I see happening right now because in case you haven't noticed yet, gradually and not so gradually, your rights and freedoms are being stripped away. Just look around. The United States of America is going to change 
and force the world to acknowledge the authority of the beast to change the word of God. How is it going to happen? Referring back to the Sunday laws in the days of Constantine, John Paul II said, only in the 4th century Constantine's time did the civil law of the Roman Empire recognize the weekly recurrence determine that on the day of the sun the judges and the people of the cities and various trade corporations would not work when through the centuries the church has made laws concerning Sunday rest the church has had in mind above all for everyone to keep the Lord's day holy in other words, the Pope is concerned for legislation to enforce everyone to keep the Lord's Day holy. And it's exactly what is cited in his Catholic catechism that Sunday should be a matter of legislation so that all can keep holy the Lord's Day. Well, what if you don't want to do it on Sunday? What if you want to do it the way the Bible says to do it when it becomes the law of the land? And not just in America, but I, I have an article that I got just the other day. The Pope has been a strong advocate for the revival of keeping Sunday. And he's trying to enforce Sunday observance into the Constitution of the European Union. And he says, without Sunday worship, we cannot live. That's Benedict XVI. He declared during a Mass on September 9 last year, without Sunday worship, we cannot live. He said, Sunday observance is a necessity for all people. That's his goal. That's his dream. But what about here in America? After 9-11, things have changed, and people have been looking more and more to the government to protect us. But every time they pass a law to protect you from the terrorists, they're taking away some of your rights. Remember that. And the balance is how much of our rights can they take away and still claim that we have freedom here? In 1961, the Supreme Court ruled that Sunday blue laws, laws enforcing Sunday observance, are now constitutional. That's a fact. And since the terrorist attack, we're witnessing a resurgence of prominent religious leaders saying that the problem with America is that we've gotten away from the Ten Commandments and we need to get back to the Ten Commandments. And Protestant religious evangelical leaders have even instituted a Ten Commandment day every year. And furthermore, in emphasizing the Ten Commandments, noted television speaker Dr. G. D. James Kennedy of Coral Ridge, who has passed away, and I respected so much because I've learned much about the gospel of Jesus Christ from this man. And I loved him. And it was a great loss to Christianity, but I don't agree with everything he said. And in his sermon, The Gift of Rest on the Ten Commandments, when he got to the Sabbath, he said, the benefit to the human race that has come through the institution of the Sabbath can hardly be overestimated. And folks, this is the chilling part. Remember, when he says Sabbath, he's thinking Sunday. And this is the chilling part. There's an old maxim that states, as goes the Sabbath, so goes the nation. Are you hearing that? And we might do well to ponder that thought and what it portends for America. As the Sabbath is desecrated, church attendance is ignored, and nations sink deeper into the mire of sin. And there are those today who are now saying the low moral condition of America is related to our breaking the Sabbath. So it doesn't take much imagination 
to see how this mindset, however true it may be, when coupled with the desire of the masses for the government to protect us, and the false prophet begins working miracles, gaining credibility for his message, the reason God is punishing America, we're not keeping the commandments, it's time to install Sunday as a national day of worship. It doesn't take much imagination for us to see that those who refuse to go along with the national day of worship will be blamed for the calamities that are facing the country. Didn't Jesus say? He did. He said, don't be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. And that in John ch chapter 16, verse 2, he said, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. You may say, well, I don't know how that can happen here. Just wait. I'm going to show you some stuff going on right now that is going to straighten your hair out. If it's already straight, it's going to curl it up. And ladies, you get a free perm. <laughs> You're not going to want to miss that night. But I think it's clear for us to see now that the issue is not so much which day do you go to church as much as who do you serve? The creator and his law or the creature and his tradition. That's the choice. Years ago, when a pope had died, the bishops met, cast their votes for a new pope. And the high point of the coronation scene came when the cardinal deacon lifted the beautiful triple tiara, placed it on his head, and said, I now crown you pope, king over heaven and earth and hell. And practically every television set was tuned in, wandering after the beast. But I'm thinking of another coronation scene. This king didn't look like a king. He didn't wear a triple tiara. He wore a crown of thorns. And he hung on a cross. He didn't look like a king. He died. He didn't look like a king. He was buried, but he rose again. Amen. Send it to heaven. And one day soon, he's going to come again. Amen. And those of us who stay faithful to him are going to be caught up to meet him in the clouds. And we're going to join that big choir in the sky. And we're going to cast our crowns at his feet and sing out. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Amen. Jesus said he was Lord even of the Sabbath.